Now, before I get all off into the nature of my critique of this and start making comparisons to Merlin the magician in reliance upon alchemy, that we repeat the same failed experiment long enough over and over again, eventually that lead will become gold. <laughs> uh, before I get all off into that, let me point out a very important word on the cover of the book. It's a two-letter word. I'm not even going to be obscene here. As. It doesn't say pacifism is pathology. It says pacifism as pathology. And I think it's a fairly important distinction to make. There's nothing in pacifism. And I am, yes I am, going to conflate its articulation of nonviolent principles with pacifism. It's a little crude, but it'll work for purposes here tonight. Pacifism, and any doctrine that I'm aware of that will withstand scrutiny and is worthy of the name, holds that one shall not inflict violence. It says nothing about one will not absorb it. It says nothing about pacifism is synonymous with avoidance of risk. It says nothing about pacifism is synonymous with avoidance of sacrifice. Struggle. There have been pacifists in a tradition of opposition in the United States ever since I was old enough to be aware of it. There was a guy by the name of Norman Morrison who was a practicing Quaker, that clear back in 1965 when I was still in high school, went down to the Pentagon to protest what they were setting out to do in Vietnam, introducing maneuver battalions at Da Nang. Poured a can of gasoline over his head, struck a match. Got attention for about four days. Now I absolutely disagree with suicide as a political tactic in almost any instance you can name. I think Norman Morrison was a person with enough talent and enough commitment that he could have had an impact if he had extended his life, but he made that choice. I can disagree with the politic of it. I can disagree with the tactic, but the one thing I cannot do is suggest that Norman Morrison avoided risk, that Norman Morrison avoided sacrifice, that Norman Morrison did not have the courage of his convictions. He most certainly did. And there are others and less extreme, although several examples of that sort from the Vietnam period I could pull up. But at a level of struggle and sacrifice in nonviolent terms, you'd have to look at the Berrigans who courted imprisonment. Absolute defiance, didn't stay safe for a moment. And again, I can run down other examples. I can run them down all night if you want. People I've worked with, people I know about. In terms of people I work with, Shara Griffith from Greenpeace, who established a peace camp that physically interposed that group of people between federal marshals and my own group at Yellow Thunder Camp occupation in the early 1980s. And there was substantial risk involved in that because those guys were coming and what they had in mind to do was something like Waco. And it worked. Had it just been the Indians and had it just been the armed struggle, where well, you had a bloodbath or one sort or another, probably wouldn't have worked out like Waco because we were better prepared for what it was that was coming, apparently, than the people were there. We were not housed in a structure that was subject to being torched and everybody inside burned alive. So it would have played out a little bit different, but by virtue of the fact of a bunch of little white kids, and that's really what it came down to in the minds of the marshal, we're not going to drive an armored personnel carrier over over the top of a bunch of kids who got well-connected and fluent parents who might just get us in a bunch of trouble. So it worked. It worked on the basis of incurring the risk. But that's not how it usually works. It's not how it usually works. It works by way of a certain sort of collaboration with the functioning of power. Because it's well understood that there are certain lines of activity which are not only condoned by the elites, but are considered necessary to demonstrate that this is a functioning democracy. All evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding things having to do with the expression of political speech, so long as you do it in a way that's proved, except it doesn't actually disrupt anything. If you won't do it, they'll come down and ask you to organize it and offer you a grant for the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And that reality goes into the definition of the movement of what actually constitutes violence, if you think about it. Consider Seattle. Y'all aware of Seattle, the WTO demonstrations that occurred there. Are you aware that the big to-do among the so-called nonviolent folk was that there were a bunch of youngsters running around wearing black masks and such, called themselves, I think, the Black Bloc. Anybody ever heard of them? <laughs> the Black Bloc was being horribly violent. They were breaking the windows in Starbucks coffee houses. <laughs> yeah. And so pristine and pure were the advocates of nonviolence in the face of this that people who could never in their wildest imaginings lift a hand to prevent a police officer from doing a damn thing, linked arms, supplanted the cops, and manhandled the black blockers away from the windows protecting the corporate property. <laughs> True story. True story. It's on videotape. Battle of Seattle. Get it out and look at these brave guys defending Starbucks from the violence of a broken window when they were ostensibly there to protest the corporate ravage of the third world that was translating into hundreds of thousands and even millions of deaths. And if you can't see the contradiction in that, you're not looking. At two levels. One, the idea that a personal posture can be assumed that precludes the violence of the context. The context is violent, that's why you're there. So it's by no means, no matter what you do, going to be a nonviolent context. Get used to it. What I'm talking about in the third world is going to go on every minute of every protest. They're the, supposedly the reasons for the protests. And the cops are wearing those guns in their hips and carrying that chemical mace and that pepper gas, that spray, and those other accoutrements of repression for a reason. You don't make them nonviolent by acquiescing. The violence is systemic and it remains there. Your acquiescence simply perpetuates it. That's at the philosophical level and at the practical level, the idea that somebody who would not oppose a police officer in the process of beating someone half to death with a riot baton could then manhandle a black blocker away from a window kind of speaks for itself. That contradiction has already been remarked. But then the upshot comes on the websites of the movement to do in the aftermath of Seattle I have one in particular, I won't name the name of the individual, and I doubt that it was a real name that was posted with it anyway, thanking the black bloc a lot, sarcasm dripping, thanks a lot guys for turning Seattle into a fascist state for the duration of your visit here. So let's see, these guys got off the buses from Eugene or wherever it was they were from, okay, and all of a sudden the police chief and the mayor both exhibiting visible shock, horrified that these guys were here and knowing they had to take drastic measures to prevent the breaking of Starbucks windows, <laughs> ran out and bought themselves a SWAT team, a couple armored personnel carriers, a whole inventory of tear gas, yeah, got everybody trained and equipped and coordinated to get out there in the street. That all happened in about 28 minutes and then, <laughs> yeah, comes around somehow or another to the idea, and it's a good old American idea, it's kind of like when H. Rap Brown made reference to violence being American as a cherry pie, yeah? So is the notion of blaming the victim. Victims of fascism somehow or another become responsible for the fact of the fascism itself. Damn Jews. If hadn't been for them, Nazis wouldn't have exterminated them all. Yeah. Maybe you can find a logical defensibility to such propositions, but I can't.